Welcome to the pulpit ministry of Mount Carmel Baptist Church, located in Campbellsville, Kentucky. My name is Trevor Bates, and I serve as the lead pastor of Mount Carmel Baptist Church. My family and I have been at Mount Carmel for just over a year now, and we are so excited for the good things that God has done, and the good things that God is doing, and the good things that we trust that in God's faithfulness, He will do in the days to come. We are so thankful that you have uh, found our pulpit ministry, and we encourage you to listen to the sermon and to pray for yourself and for those with whom you might share it, uh, that you and they would be changed by the power of the gospel, for it is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. preach about this old story that rescued me. Uh, that is what we come to do. My preaching is ultimately worship to this Lord Jesus Christ who saved my soul and set me free. So it is truly such a joy to be able to open this word together and to be able to see in it more about this Lord Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you this morning to listen well to the words of our Lord. Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse Twenty and reading through verse 30. And he, being Jesus, came home, and the crowd gathered again, to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, He has lost his senses. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sin shall be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Let's pray. Father, you know my own weakness. You know my own frailty. Lord, you know how desperately I need you every hour. So, Father, I ask that you would reveal to us more this morning about how precious and how wonderful your Son is. And, Father, would you start by revealing that to me and reveal that to each and every one of us here this morning so that we might love your Son all the more as we see him all the more. Lord, your Son is worthy. He is so worthy of all that we have to give. Because all that we have has been given to us by Him. Father, would you help us this morning to grow in grace through your Word. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. This morning I want to look together as we answer one simple question from our passage. What is Blasphemy. What is blasphemy? My brother and his family came down from Louisville to visit with us last Sunday afternoon. And while they were here, my brother shared a story with me about a mutual friend of ours. There's a guy who went hiking with his mom many years ago. And whoever was with them on this particular hiking trip had taken a photo of the then young boy and his mom as they hiked the trail. And in the background, you can see the young boy holding his mom's hand as they're walking through this trail, and they were walking through a rocky place on the trail. But something they had never noticed was pointed out by a friend when he showed them that picture. Many years down the road, he was showing his friend that photo, and his friend said, hold on, wait a minute, there's something weird about this picture. 
And just in the foreground of that picture, you could see something right on the other side of the rock on which they were standing. It was a group of snakes. There were several snakes just a few inches away from where this young boy and his mom were standing. And not just any snakes, but eastern diamondback rattlesnakes. Very deadly snakes were just a few inches from them, and they never knew the better. Because they were so focused on the trail, so focused on the hike that was in front of them, their perspective was geared only toward here and not toward what was beside them. And so that story tells us something about perspective, that perspective matters. How we view the world, our worldview, how we understand the things around us and the things of God and the things of Scripture, all of that matters. Our theology matters. And this morning, what we're going to see is ultimately three perspectives or three worldviews, three understandings of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are three groups of people I want to introduce us to this morning. First is that the family of Jesus says that he is delusional. The family says delusional. Second, the foes say demonic. And thirdly, the facts say divine. So let's begin with our first point here in verse 20. The family says delusional. Look with me beginning at verse 20. And he, again being Jesus, came home and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that he could not even eat a meal. Now let's paint this picture in our mind. Let's set the scene for us. Here is Jesus arriving back into his hometown, very likely Capernaum, because he, for the majority of his ministry, was living with St. Peter in Peter's house. And so he would have considered that home, even though he was born in Nazareth, a man from Galilee, he considered Capernaum his home. That's where he would rest his head. That's where he would go to sleep at night, is back at Peter's home. And so very likely this is in Capernaum. So here's Jesus coming back into Capernaum, back home, back to find some rest from his journey. Remember that thus far in the, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has just been going and going and going. He's been going from one city to another. They had to even eat along the pathway because they didn't have time to stop and eat. They didn't have time to sit down and eat a steak and potato meal. They had to just pick some grains as they walked. And so Jesus is constantly running full force into this ministry. And here he goes back home for a moment of rest. And as he enters into his town, what happens? He enters back into his hometown, verse 20, and the crowd gathered again. Now this crowd followed Jesus everywhere. No matter what city he was in, no matter what home he was in, no matter what synagogue he was in, these people wanted to see and hear and experience what Jesus was all about. And the majority of them just wanted the experience. They just wanted to have something to talk about in their friend group. They wanted some, as we would call it, water cooler talk. They wanted to be able to say, hey, I experienced this. I was part of this. I got to tell you what happened. That's where the majority of these people were. They didn't truly want to see Jesus. They just wanted to experience what he had to offer. And so as Jesus comes back into his hometown where he had expected to find comfort, he and his disciples instead found conflict. And so here's Jesus in Capernaum. The crowds have already begun to gather. And the fact that this crowd gathers and follows him everywhere he goes ultimately tells us two things. First, it's that Jesus was, is, and will always be unlike anyone else. There is nobody like Jesus. The crowds were gathering because of the wonderful power of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had never witnessed anyone preach with such authority as this. They said that themselves. They had never witnessed such miracle working power as Jesus possessed. They had never seen or heard anybody like Jesus. And I would submit to us this morning that you and I have never seen or heard anybody like Jesus. There is nobody like Jesus. And the minute that we begin to compare other people to Jesus and begin to idolize and worship other people, we have misplaced our worship. We have a wrong God on the throne of our heart because Jesus is like nobody else. And the crowd gathers to show that. Remember that in 
Exodus chapter 7, Moses and Aaron go to stand before Pharaoh and to say, let the Lord's people go. And as they do, Moses instructs Aaron to cast down his rod and his rod will become a serpent. Well, as he does that, Pharaoh summons his sorcerers and his sorcerers begin to cast their rods down and their rods become serpents. And it looks like the sorcerers have matched the power of God through Aaron. But what happens? Remember the story in Exodus 7. Aaron's serpent begins to swallow up all the others and makes naught of them. And it proves that there is nothing that matches the power of God. And in Jesus Christ is the fullness of the power of God, and nothing matches that power. And so everybody had to come and see what this was all about. Secondly, what we see in verse 20 is the extent of this crowd. It says, And he came home, and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. Now the word that's used there for meal is literally bread. It's altos, which means that they couldn't even break bread. It's not just saying that they couldn't spread out a table. They couldn't get out all the cutlery. They couldn't get out all the sodas. They couldn't set this large feast for themselves. It's not saying that they were just pressed for room. It's saying that there was no room at all to even lift up their arms, break bread, and pass it out. That's how large, how massive this crowd was. Oh, to see crowds like this flock to see Jesus today. How wonderful would it be to have crowds flocking to hear the word of God today. That's how large this crowd was. These people had what we would refer to today as FOMO or fear of missing out. They wanted to hear and see everything about Jesus. They had heard the stories. They had seen the miracles. They wanted front row seats to this person, Jesus Christ. Move along with me to verse 21. Remembering in the background of your mind that in verse 20, this crowd is gathering, pressing in on Jesus. Here we find ourselves in verse 21, and it says, when his own people, that is literally to be translated, when his family, his loved ones, his brothers and sisters, those who literally grew up under the same roof as him, those who had the same maternal, uh, the, the same mother and the same earthly father, those who were closest to him. And he, when his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him. For they were saying, he has lost his senses. You can just hear them now. His own family members are peeking out the window. They move back the window curtain and they look out and they say, is that Jesus over there? What is all this crowd about? This used to be such a quiet little town. Look at all this. He's lost his mind. What's wrong with him? That's Jesus. That's the one who ate meals with us growing up. That's the one who came from the same poor neighborhood we came from, and now he's got all this crowd following him? What is this? You can just hear them now. When his own people heard of this, that is when his family heard of this, they went out to take custody of him. Now this word custody is the same word that's used in Matthew 26 when Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss and the, the, the Roman guards come to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, they come and arrest him. They come and seize him. They come and drag him away. That's the same word that's used here in verse 21, that they have come to take custody of him. They have come to arrest him, to seize him, to say, Jesus, come to your senses. And they begin to drag him away back to the house, maybe so his mother can give him a whooping. At least that's what they had in their mind. Jesus has lost his senses. They view him as delusional. The family members intended on dragging Jesus out of the middle of that crowd. And maybe there's a sense of jealousy here. That they grew up in the same household. They grew up in the same conditions. They grew up in the same poverty. They grew up working the same jobs as Jesus. And Jesus has made it. And yet here they are, still in their hometown. They very likely never even stepped foot out of their hometown. They're still stuck in Capernaum, and they see Jesus going around gathering fame and gathering followers, and they want a piece of that, and so they would rather drag Jesus out of it. 
then join in on it. They viewed him as delusional. They wanted to knock some sense in him. They literally said he has lost his senses. He is out of his mind. He is beside himself. His mind is over here and his body is over here. He's doing something that is completely ridiculous is what they're saying. Now there are two things that a lot of people like to say about Jesus. They like to split his being. They like to say, well, sure, Jesus is a good teacher, but he's not God. He's just a good teacher. He taught some good things. He gave us some good principles. He gave us some good morals, and we can apply those things, but he's not God. Well, there's a problem there. Because Jesus explicitly claims himself to be God. Over and over again, as we've seen thus far in Mark's gospel, and as we'll continue to see in the unfolding chapters of Mark's gospel, Jesus reveals himself to be God. He even says so much, I and the Father are one. And we're going to look in this text about blasphemy. If Jesus is saying that he is God, he is equating himself with the God of the universe, the Father, the the Trinitarian Godhead who created all things. If Jesus is saying, I and the Father are one, I am God in the flesh, and he's not, then he's a blasphemer. And anyone who is a blasphemer is not a good teacher. They're a false teacher. They're a false prophet. And so Jesus can't just be a good teacher. He's got to be something more than that. Or maybe he's God, but some of his teachings are a little troublesome. Some of his teachings don't really match up with what makes sense for us today. They're old news. Let's dismiss of them. So Jesus is only God. Well, the problem with that is that here's Jesus walking. He comes back into his hometown. This crowd is gathering, and in verse 20, he's desiring after a meal. He's hungry. He has family. His family, in verse 21, begins to grab him. He has a literal physical body that they begin to try to drag away, so he can't only be God. He is truly God and truly man. But the family members didn't see this. The family members simply did not believe in the identity Jesus was revealing himself to believe. They didn't think he was deity. They thought he was delusional. John affirms that some of Jesus' own family members didn't believe in him. John 7 verse 5 says, For not even his own brothers were believing in him. For not even his own brothers were believing in him. Now, barring his half-brother, James, who wrote the book of James that we studied last year, and a couple of others named later in Mark's gospel, the majority of Jesus' brothers and sisters did not believe in him. They did not follow him. They were numbered among this group who went out to seize him. They thought that he had lost his mind. They literally believed that he had lost his senses, that he had misplaced his sanity somewhere among the crowd. And so they thought he needed an intervention. They thought that he needed a swift kick to be reeled back in. That's the first perspective is... The family says delusional. The second we get to in verse 22, the foes say demonic. The foes say demonic. Verse 22, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Now, it's important to note in verse 22 that these scribes came down from Jerusalem. They heard that Jesus was going back to Capernaum. They heard that a crowd was beginning to gather there, and they wanted to be a part of it. Now, what have we seen thus far in Mark's gospel? We've seen that the the scribes and the Pharisees are constantly following Jesus for what? To affirm him, to celebrate him, to worship him, to praise him? No, they're following him everywhere he goes to question him to try to dismantle his ministry. That is the sole reason they have come down from Jerusalem. They have journeyed a long way just to go mock Jesus. They have traveled a long way, put on their Sunday best, just to come and say something about Jesus that might dismantle the ministry that he has. And Maybe that's your attitude to coming to church. You come in just so you can sit there and mock others. 
you sit there and wag your finger and wag your head at what everybody else is doing, wondering what in the world is wrong with them? What's possessed them so that they would sing like this and they would pray like this? Why do they believe all of this? Maybe that's you this morning. But what we'll find out is what would be true for you if you are living like this, that it does not go well for the scribes. The scribes, verse 22, came down from Jerusalem and they were saying something. They were going through the crowd trying to stir people up to division and stir people up toward hatred against Jesus. They said, He is possessed by Beelzebul. And Mark 1, verse 1 Mark calls Jesus the Son of God or the Lord of all creation. In Mark 2, verse 28, Jesus calls Himself the Lord of the Sabbath. But notice what the scribes say here. They say that Jesus serves Beelzebul. Literally, this word Beelzebul is a title that means Lord of the Flies. Or if we want to get more literal about it and more possibly offensive because that's what the scribes meant to do. It literally means Lord of dung. That Jesus is Lord of dung and he serves Lord of dung. That's literally what Beelzebul means. And so what these scribes, what these Pharisees were in effect saying is that Jesus is not Lord of creation. He is not the Son of God. He is not the Lord of the Sabbath. But instead, Jesus is subservient. That is, he, he serves someone else. He is subjected to another. And do you know who he, is, who he is subject to according to them? The devil. The devil. That he is subservient to or made lower than the lowest of the low. The most vulgar of all creatures. Now the scribes and Jesus and everybody gathered here would have had one thing in common, that they all viewed the devil as a vulgar creature. And so for them to say that Jesus serves this vulgar creature named the devil is to say that Jesus belongs on the bottom of a shoe. That Jesus is the lowest of the low. In other words, the scribes are trying to say Jesus means to us less than all the rest of you. He means to us absolutely nothing. Now remember that back in the beginning of Mark chapter 3, they're already beginning to stir up questions as to how they might destroy him. They want him dead. And this just further expresses that inward emotion that they have toward Jesus, an emotion of absolute and utter hatred. They hated Jesus. They hated Jesus. So much so that they would say that he served the devil. This is blasphemy. This is the sin, as we'll see later, that Jesus says will never be forgiven. Attributing the work of God to the work of the devil is unforgivable. Dying in denial and hatred toward God is unpardonable. This is the sin that God never forgives. Now here's what we need to understand about these scribes very quickly. Ezra of the Old Testament was a scribe. He was a good student of the law, which is the definition of a scribe. That he was studious about the law. He took very seriously the Mosaic law. He studied every jot and tittle of it. He wanted to get it just right so that he could help the people apply the law to their lives. He was essentially a lawyer or an attorney for the Pharisees. The Pharisees taught, and then the scribes studied so that they could help apply what the Pharisees taught. They were expositors of the law. That is, they were people who helped make sense of the law for the people to understand it and apply it. In Ezra chapter 7, verse 6, it says, Ezra was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. So a scribe is one who is skilled in the law of of Moses. But one commentator says this of the scribes. Quote, the scribes became professionals at spelling out the letter of the law while ignoring the spirit behind it. Things became so bad that the regulations and traditions the scribes added to the law were actually considered more important than the law itself. 
This led to many confrontations between Jesus and the Pharisees and scribes. The scribes' original aim was in earnest, to know and preserve the law and encourage others to keep it. But things turned horribly wrong when man-made traditions overshadowed God's word and a pretense of holiness replaced a life of true godliness. End quote. So the scribes went further. Not only saying here in verse 22 that Jesus is on the devil's payroll, not only saying that Jesus is working for the devil, but look with me at the end of verse 22. He casts out demons by the ruler of the demons, or literally by the power of the ruler of the demons. In other words, what they're saying is, you see all this power that he's displaying for us? You see all this authority that he's displaying for us? Yeah, all that comes from the devil. Ultimately, Jesus has no power within himself. He's just drawing all of this from the devil whom he serves. This is blasphemy. Listen to what the Bible says on the sheer power or might of Almighty God. Psalm 21, verse 13. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. God is worthy of all praise for his great power. What about Psalm 29, verse 4? The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. Remember that in Genesis, in the creation account, we have the Lord speaking and things becoming. It is by the mere voice of God that all of this power comes out from him. The voice of the Lord is powerful, Psalm 29 says. Psalm 49, verse 15, But God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Selah. Literally, God will redeem me from death and destruction. Death and destruction and the devil, they have no ultimate power over Jesus. Jesus has power over them. Mark 13, verse 26, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. So when we see the Lord return, we will finally behold the fullness of His power. And we will say, look how glorious He is. We're not going to say, wow, that's really neat. Look at that. We're going to fall down on our knees in absolute humble admiration and worship, saying, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And we will sing that song as the ages roll on for all eternity because He is glorious, mighty, and powerful. And all of that might comes from Himself. He is within Himself omnipotent. That is, He is all-powerful within Himself. He does not draw His power from you, from me, from our decisions, from the devil. He doesn't draw His power from any other circumstance except that He is within Himself all-powerful. That's the God we serve. Ephesians 1, verses 18 through 20. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. To what? What are we praying that God would open our heart up to? What are we praying that God would reveal more to us? So that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which He brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Jesus has the fullness and the trueness of the power of God within him. These Pharisees are blasphemous. These scribes are blasphemous. Finally now, we look at this third perspective. The facts say divine. The facts say divine. Divine. Pick back up with me in verse 23 in our text. And he, Jesus, called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. Here in verses 23 through 26, Jesus speaks in a parable. Now maybe you're familiar with the scientific principle or of of force. Think back to your grade school days. What is force? There are two interactions which objects may have with one another. Either push or pull. 
You're either pushing something away from yourself or pulling something toward yourself. Think about a magnet. If you have two ends of the same end, what are they going to do? They're going to push against each other. If you have opposite ends, they're going to go together. That's force. Jesus offers here a parable in response to the absurd claims lobbied from both his family and his foes. He asks a very simple question in verse 23. In short, he asks, how does that make any sense at all? Look with me at verse 23. And he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? You're saying that I work for the devil, and yet I've come for the purpose of saving people from the devil, of saving people from the wrath of God because of their sins in following the devil, and yet I'm working for him? I've overcome the power of demons, and the demons have said, you are the son of God. They have affirmed my identity. I've overcome the power of sickness and illness and ailments and all sorts of diseases. I've done all of this. And yet, you're saying, I'm on the devil's payroll? How does that make any sense? Just, just think through this, he's telling them. Think logically through what you're saying. Don't just spew out words because they sound good. Jesus here calls them out on his absurdity. Here are his family members on one side of him calling him crazy. Meanwhile, they've all been listening to his teaching, shocked with amazement at the clarity and authority with which he spoke. So he can't be crazy. He's speaking with such clarity, he can't be crazy. Here are his foes calling him criminal, calling him a blasphemer, which was a crime in that day and should be a crime today. Meanwhile, they were following him around like puppy dogs just to witness his healing power. Power, by the way, which was affirmed audibly by God the Father at the baptism of Jesus, saying that it is well-pleasing power to the Father. The Father wouldn't be well-pleased with the power of the devil, right? So how does this make any sense, what these scribes are saying? Jesus, in effect, is calling the scribes fools. He's saying, wait, 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 wait. You're supposed to be the ones who make sense of everything for the people, right? You're supposed to be the ones who, who help people to understand the things of life. You're supposed to be the ones who speak clearly. You're not speaking very clearly now. You make no sense about what you're saying. This is the question that Jesus asks. How does that make sense? How can Satan cast out Satan? And he goes on and he ex explains what he means here. Look with me at verses 24 through 26. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand that he is finished. In other words, if there's constantly this division within a household, that house is eventually going to fracture and split. And so if the devil is saying, I'm going to raise up somebody who begins to fight against me in my own domain of darkness, that domain's going to crumble. But what's happening here? Well, what we see is that domain of darkness is still at that point in time very much alive because the scribes are in that domain. They're in the domain of darkness because they are in denial of the person and work of Jesus. And you this morning, if you are in denial of who Jesus is, are in the domain of darkness. Now there are a couple of things I want us to see in verses 24 through 26 on a house being divided against itself. There's the obvious thing that we need to draw from this, that Jesus isn't on the devil's payroll, and he's making that clear by pointing out the absurdity of thinking that what he is doing could even remotely be linked to honoring or worshiping the devil. Jesus is supremely better than anything else in the world, and to think that his power comes from the devil is the essence of stupidity. Remember that in Proverbs 1, verse 7, we're told that the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Ignorant fools despise wisdom and discipline. The scribes did not fear God. They feared being told they were wrong, and because Jesus did that, they turned against him. They hated him. They despised Jesus. 
There was no fear of God in these people. And today, I believe that we desperately need again a fear of God in our nation and in our churches and in our households. We need to understand that God is holy, 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 and that God is just and He will judge sin and sinners by sending them to a place called hell, which will be an eternal torment for them. We need to have a healthy fear of God. But that fear had dried up for these scribes. They weren't afraid of God. They did not believe in the way, the truth, and the life who was there, but instead they leaned on their own understanding. The second thing is that maybe some of us in this room this morning are like these scribes, denying the obvious reality of truth that is right in front of us. Saying, yes, I've seen God work wonderfully in my life. I've seen God save people from the brink of death. I've seen God's wonderful grace at work in the lives of my family members, but I still don't believe it. Turn away from that folly today. Let today be the day of salvation. Because, look with me at verse 26. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Here we are told that Jesus is the plunderer, that he is the one who goes into the domain of the devil and tears it apart. Not as one who is working for the devil, but one who is working against the devil. And he comes at the cross at Calvary and tears it all down by binding this strong man, by binding the devil, by binding our sin to the cross, by paying it all for us at Calvary's cross. Remember the lyrics of the old hymn, To God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life an atonement for sin and opened the life gate that we may go in. It was Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great 20th century doctor turned London, England preacher, who said this, Are you glorying in the cross? Is the cross everything to you? Is this life to you? Your eternal, everlasting destiny depends upon this one thing. Have you seen that God has provided there the only way whereby you can be forgiven and become a child of God and go to inherit the glories of eternity? May God have mercy upon us all and by His Spirit open our eyes to see the glory of the cross. Church, the reason the cross makes it front and center to every sermon that I preach is because the cross is all we have. And the cross is all we need. It is the cross of Christ that is the center of the Christian's life. For it is there that we go to die and it is there that we come to life. Jesus in verse 27 says, nobody who's working in the domain of the devil can ever destroy the devil. But I have come to bind the devil and to destroy his works. Finally, in these last verses, 28 through 30, Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. To attribute God's work to the devil's power is blasphemy. It is blasphemy. And deserving of eternal punishment. Let me close with an illustration and one simple question. Suppose that there are three men who witnessed a bank robbery. One man was the town drunk who rarely ever found, was ever found sober enough and in his right mind to be trusted to tell the truth. The second man was good friends with the suspected robbers, himself being a suspect. The third was the bank teller who was on the other side of the gun. Now suppose that these three men are each asked to give a statement to the police. The detective comes to each of them and says, excuse me, town drunk, who's 
probably drunk right now. Could you tell me what happened? Excuse me, person who's a suspect, could you tell me what happened? Excuse me, person who was a victim, could you tell me what happened? Whose story would you be inclined to believe? The one who couldn't come to his senses? The one who wanted to try to make himself look good and innocent? Or the one who had never given us reason to doubt him? Beloved, we are presented with three perspectives in this passage. His family, who hadn't come to their senses, about the obvious reality in front of them. His foes who wanted to make themselves look good. And Jesus Christ, who has always been faithful and won't start being unfaithful now. So you need to ask yourself this morning, where is your soul? Who do you believe Jesus is? Who is Jesus? Let's pray.